So, yeah, today we are going to have our workshop, right? Yeah. Hey, it's good for you. So, let's uh, pray and ask the Lord to be with us at this time. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, O oh Lord, for your mercy, for uh, allowing us, O oh Lord God, to continue to uh, serve you and Thank you for the blessings, the privileges, Lord God, the opportunities. Thank you for the strength. Lord, uh, help us to always walk in the Spirit. And uh, help us, O oh Lord, by your grace to uh, really guard our hearts each time, each day. I know, Father, that even as we are studying, we can also forget to take care of our own hearts. So, Lord, uh, by your grace and mercy, keep us self-aware and help us, Lord God, to always uh, walk in the light and in the truth. Uh, allow us, oh Lord God, to always receive uh, correction if necessary and advice or admonition as uh, your Spirit continues to work in us, Lord. So, in this class, once again, we pray for your grace as we uh, talk about <coughs> preaching uh, narratives, Lord. I know each one, Lord God, is at different stages, Lord God, in the process. Some are able to do do this now more comfortably, while others are still working on it and struggling. So I just pray that you would come alongside each one, Lord, according to their need, and be able to help their father so that they can gain confidence. <coughs> so Lord, thank you so much for this time, we just commit to you our class today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. So, we are looking at, well, I think we have not yet finished or completed the, the session, right? I think there are some things that we were not able to discuss yet. But I may find more. Is that true? Nobody's answering me, so that means you're so, so full already of uh, requirements <laughs> and other subjects that we don't know anymore where we are. Okay. Yeah, I think we have not yet uh, talked about that, right? Good. So let's talk about uh, first, before we go to the workshop, the homiletical outline uh, for narratives. Uh, somebody read that uh, first quotation from uh, Ray Danus, page 156. All sermons of the aim of the clarity point from this incoherence of the deductive form, the heatedness, movement, and total listener, listener in both the deductive form. The sermon ought to address the whole person rather than on rather than only or emotional or All right. So, of course, Ray Dallas is speaking about uh, uh, traditional preaching done in the pulpit, as most of us probably would understand it, okay? And, uh, of course, coming from uh, the West, uh, there is really that preference for a didactic uh, form, you know, something logical. Uh, with points, you know, point one, two, and three, or usually three, right? Uh, especially if you're a Baptist, uh, you know, you gotta have three points. <laughs> uh, if you're Pentecostal, you have ten, maybe, <laughs> or twenty, depending on your tradition. Uh, if, you're, if you're super spiritual, maybe you don't, you know, you have one hundred points and you don't know what's your point. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh, uh, there, there is a rightful balance, and again, of course, we, we are talking about uh, speeches, right? So that's basically what preaching is all about in the contemporary church. Okay, we're talking about standing in front and delivering a speech. And uh, in reality, of course, that's not all there is to communicating God's word. But at the, at the very least, that's what we're familiar with, right? Uh, I hope that we can learn other forms of communication. I hope that uh, leaders like you who are being trained would also explore different uh, avenues or media, okay, 
in order for us to communicate. And each kind of media would require a different uh, strategy or technique or skill to learn. I'm talking about, for example, the internet, okay, or uh, <coughs> multimedia or something. There are other forms of communicating God's Word today, not just standing in front of the pulpit, okay? And uh, I'm just challenging you in that area because most of the time uh, we get stuck with a certain kind of form. And uh, I'm referring, of course, to standing in the pulpit uh, in a live uh, congregation. That, of course, is uh, very legitimate and uh, we do that all the time. But there are millions and millions of people who will never enter the door of a traditional church. There are many people probably who would not sit in the pew for about one hour to, to listen to what we're about to say. So all this talk about uh, you know preaching well, of course, is is good. But uh, I hope and pray I'm challenging all of you to also explore other avenues, okay? Because uh, right now the media is really shaping the minds and hearts of many young people. And those of us who have a word to say, those of us who have a message to say to these people, we fail because we don't know how to do that in that arena. We are not so equipped in that arena. All right? I remember my first attempt in trying to come up with a, uh, a video talk. Uh, I was supposed to look at the camera, you know, like what, you know, showbiz people do, you know. It was very hard for me because I'm not used to that, you know. So I had to train myself how to focus on the camera and speak as if the person I'm talking to is, you know, just right there. Uh, and uh, also an experience where I was just recording all by myself in my room. And I was just teaching with just the camera. And I'm supposed to pretend that there are people. You know, it's just so hard. Okay? <laughs> have you tried that? Anyone else have tried that here? Okay, well, you know, that, that's good. Uh, and the thing is, the reason why I'm going in that direction, uh, because I know the Word of God is alive and active, and people need the Word. But if I'm just going to rely on the pulpit to do that, uh, I won't be able to spread the Word of God far more effectively. Yeah. But yeah, with the rise of many forms that uh, uh, pastors are using today, mm -hmm. there's an extremes that we have to avoid. Mm -hmm. Are there extremes? Well, you don't have to be a showman. <laughs> You're not there for entertainment. You you want to deliver the word of God, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so that it may be accessible to people who may not be able to enter the doors of the traditional church. Now, I have no problems with those who attend church on a Sunday. I can speak to them, mm -hmm. all right? I'm able to reach them. But uh, each of us probably would have a certain limitation in the way we communicate. and. Uh, you know, we don't have so many people. Maybe if you're Peter Tanchi, you're communicating to thousands. But for many of us, probably we can only communicate to maybe 100, 200 people, maybe 300 uh, at each time. And I'm concerned about uh, the millions of people who have yet to hear Christ. That's my concern. And uh, I think the, the dangers might be to, to use media for simply the sake of maybe becoming famous maybe. All right, or try to make a name for yourself. So I think that's a hard issue. But uh, the media itself is, uh, I think, uh, amoral. You know, I mean, there is not, there's no nothing uh, immoral about the media itself. Just a medium. I think if the apostle Paul is alive today, he would use email, he would use YouTube. You know, he would use every means possible to try to communicate to people. So that's what I'm doing right now. Okay, uh, trying to. Uh, use different uh, ways to try to communicate the Word of God. Uh, I'm in YouTube, I'm in iTunes, uh, I'm in every, everywhere. <laughs> trying to uh, reach as many people as I can. Because uh, I think that is uh, our uh, obligation. As those who have heard the truth, we must proclaim it wherever we can and by whatever means. Okay. So let's go back to traditional preaching in the pulpit. Okay. Uh, so Gregorius is advocating a you know a, a balance between you know the 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 style of preaching that is interesting 
dynamic, you know, engaging, which is uh, more story-like in form. Okay, he's advocating that. And then at the same time, he says that make sure that it, it also has that clarity or, uh, you know, or, or logic of a didactic sermon. In preaching one, you've been taught how to make sure that your sermons are coherent, make sense, it flows naturally and logically. There's a controlling question that guides the entire sermon, you know. And, uh, of course, uh, hopefully you're now able to do that uh, quite regularly. Uh, is that true? Am I assuming too much? Are you able to somehow come up with a, you know, didactic, logical sermon that makes sense and people would say to you, you know, I understand. Yeah, thank you. you know? Are you able to do, do that now? All right. Okay. <laughs> Not so many people are raising their hands. Can I, again, what's more? Do you feel confident that you're able to uh, make a sermon, a didactic sermon, you know, in terms of outlining, in terms of form, uh, you know, logical, with points here, you know, point names? You know, first point, second point, third point, and then there's a preaching idea in the end. And afterwards, people come to you and say, you know, Pastor, I was so blessed, not by your jokes, but by the coherence <laughs> of the message. And I really understand it. Okay. So how many of you are more confident in that arena? You know, like, uh, you're able to do that quite well. Then? All right. So, yeah, that's, uh, how many of you are still struggling in that area? You know, like... So you turn white, you know, and Sunday comes, you tremble, maybe and your eyes just go around like that, you know, because you don't know what to do, right? Now, how many of you are still struggling in that area? Well, okay. How many of you don't care what I ask? <laughs> <laughs> Those are just two questions, my goodness. Some, some of you answer the first one, some of you answer the second one, and the rest of you like, <laughs> Where are you? Huh? We don't preach. Huh? We don't preach. Oh, you don't preach? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, they exhort. Yeah. Uh, you just exhort. Okay, you're not allowed to preach, you only exhort. No. Just kidding. So, I suppose I'm wrong. Sorry about that. Okay, so, uh, so how many of you are not really preaching regularly? Just for me to know. You don't preach regularly. Well, okay. So, now I know. Okay. Why are you here? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> I hope you can preach more regularly, of course. Okay. Then we go back to our country. Huh? Then we go back to our country. When you go back to I thought you were a Filipino, you know? Where are you from? Huh? Indonesia. You're from Indonesia? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you look like a Filipino, huh? Yes. Oh, well, I thought you were a Filipino. I was about to speak to you in Filipino, so it's a good thing you told me. Uh, are, are you Iranians or something? You know? <laughs> <laughs> He's Korea. Korea? 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 <laughs> Korea? <laughs> Both of you? No. Yeah. From what? Mongolia? No? <laughs> <laughs> from India? From India? Okay. And where are you from? Indonesia. Indonesia? Indonesia? Uh, Indonesia? From Pakistan? <laughs> <laughs> Chinese? Alright, so much for jokes. Let's go. We are advocating a variety of preaching forms uh, during the weekly preaching series, uh, thus using different combinations of didactic and, and narrative elements uh, is best during a lengthy series in the historic books. Now, let's just talk about the series idea, okay? Uh, how many of you do series? Those of you who are preaching regularly, how many of you do series? What is the usual length of your series? One month. One month. Yeah, some people advocate, uh, you know, lengthy series, but in my experience, it doesn't really work. They're doing a lengthy series, all right? Uh, anyway, that's my experience. But uh, anyway, it's good to have a series. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, one of the advantages of preaching, uh, you know, a one-point sermon, like I always do usually, okay? Although sometimes I also preach more than one point uh, in some instances. But generally speaking, I preach one-point sermons. Uh, but that allows me really to talk about a certain issue, you know, uh, with uh, enough time, okay? So, for example, if I have a sermon, normal sermon of four points, I can preach that same sermon four times, you know, just talking about one point each time. <laughs> and that's uh, developing it, rather than being forced to develop all four points in one sermon. Because then I would have to rush, right? Because if I have four points in a sermon, uh, I would spend about 10, 15 minutes for each point. Uh, that's an hour, okay? And then I, I won't be able to do justice to it. 
because ten fifteen minutes may not be enough to try to prove the point, you know, clarify it, and really apply it. Ah, uh, I may be different, but that's the way I, I see it. Unlike if I'm just preaching one point, I have enough time to really just develop it, you know, and really emphasize it, uh, so that by the end of the the, the sermon, uh, the li listeners actually understand that single point that I'm trying to make. Okay, so that's the challenge, really. Uh, anyway. So, uh, consider the continuum of force within pure didactic and pure uh, narrative. The middle ground has great possibilities uh, for fresh preaching points. So, we're talking about, uh, you know, a continuum there, whether in pure narrative, uh, sometimes called first person narrative, when you preach. How many of you have tried uh, first person? Great for you. How was it? Was it huh? It was great for you, huh? It was great for you? <laughs> oh, no, the audience, you know. <laughs> Did they suffer? <laughs> uh, it's entirely to preach on the first person. Uh, I, did this, I did this once, well, more than once, but one, the first time I... Uh, not, was it the first time? But I remember doing it one time in class, here at ICSL. Uh, I preached in uh, uh, Psalm 42. And I pretended to be lazy, uh, composing the song. It was hard, you know, because I always forget that I was David. I'm supposed to remember that I'm, I'm David, I'm David, okay? <laughs> so when I'm preaching, I, I forget <laughs> that I'm David. So anyway, that's a, a pure narrative, and then there's a, what you call a, a pure didactic form. Pure didactic, you know? I don't know exactly how that looks like, you know? Uh, maybe, you know, like... While you're talking, people are all asleep, you know, maybe that's a pure didactic. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he's saying maybe striking the balance right here, the middle, okay? Uh, having some aspects of your talk which is didactic and then some aspects of your talk which is uh, narrative. Okay, let's look at letter A here. Uh, a didactic structure uh, may incorporate uh, narrative uh, segments. Okay, so how do you do that? Okay, number one, can somebody read that? Well, let's go ahead and, and just assign, starting from the back, going that way, alright? Can you read that? <coughs> number one, yeah. Because the writer is the narrative, the preaching idea may be used, especially when the main points guide Alright, now even there in the introduction, uh, you can start using a, a narrative approach by, you know, really uh, starting up with fresh stories and, you know, being able to tell a story, of course, is a skill. How many of you find it easy to tell a story? Especially in a, in a public, you know, you can tell a story quite easily. Alright, that's good, okay? Because some people really, you know, uh, can't or have a hard time trying to tell a story uh, during a sermon. And I think the reason is because we tend to take ourselves too seriously. We, we become so stiff when we are in front of the people, okay? Because normally we can actually tell a story when we are not preaching. How many of you can tell a story when you are not preaching? I mean, it's normal. In the canteen, you know, I saw this, you know, person, you know, she was crossing the road, and here comes this, you know, trap, you know. I did not hit her, of course, but... <laughs> But a tricycle did, you know. <laughs> so when you tell a story, uh, you know, you often normally do this when you're not conscious, uh, when you're not, you know, focusing about your reputation and you're not afraid of making mistakes. You do this quite well, all right? And that's the secret, really, when you're trying to uh, use uh, narratives in, in, your, in your normal preaching, even preaching one style. Okay, number two, let's read that. Alright, okay, we talked about that. Zoom in, zoom out. How many of you understand that? Zoom in, zoom out. Alright, so don't, how many of you don't understand zoom in and zoom out? If you're, not, you're confused about that. Alright, so it has to do with like pretending that you're a camera, okay, and the rest of the audience are actually with you, so you can actually describe a scene up close, or you can talk about a certain scene from afar, like describing it, okay? 
Uh, what do you mean by vividness anyway? How do you create vividness in storytelling? <coughs> How do you engage people's uh, emotions and imaginations? You know, whenever you're telling some kind of story, can somebody help me out? Yeah, give uh, the details. All right, precisely. Use details, okay? Use details. Don't make generics. No, don't say once there was this place. Which place? You know. Well, in some kind of mountain. What mountain? <laughs> okay, so the more you give details, the more it becomes engaging, all right, and interesting. What else? What else can you do to create vividness? Be descriptive. Yeah. Be descriptive. Now, well, you know, description oftentimes can be overdone, and it doesn't really create a lot of uh, imagination, okay? Because you have to use a lot of adjectives to do that, you know? There was this, you know, bright, uh, shining light. That was warm, and, you know. So you can just go on describing things, and like, you know, it's like we, it's very hard to to, uh, no, to do that. So adjectives don't do that. It's better to use verbs. It's better to use, uh, you know, action words rather than uh, describing a person. You know how tall he is. Notice in Hebrew storytelling, you seldom find that. Okay, in he in Old Testament narrative, you seldom find descriptions. In fact, when they do happen, they become exceptions to, to the rule. Okay, when somebody is described physically, it's an exception. But generally, they don't do that. Generally, they tell you what happened, the action that transpired. Somebody was raising up his hand. Yes, we can, we can highlight the uh, protagonist or antagonist emotions or mm. his thoughts. Right. And how do you do that? For example, if we're preaching about uh, uh, the Good Samaritan, mm. uh, the person who had been robbed, we can we can. Uh, highlight, you know, as the Levite passes by, in, in the mind of this person he was crying out, help me out. Alright, so that would depend on whether the text would allow you, you know, to have that kind of uh, creative license to describe it further than what the text would say, or maybe in the Greek it has that connotation. Alright, now of course you know, a lot of words uh, in, the, in, the, in the text, for like example, in the Hebrew, are very picturesque, you know, Hebrew words, the Hebrew language is very picturesque, alright? Uh, Greek is more precise, right? So they have a specific word for a particular thing, right? But Hebrew is more, uh, you know, creates pictures, right? Uh, that's why, you know, for example, in referring to emotions, they talk about the stomach rather than the heart, okay? And, and we need to get into those, uh, that's why you're being trained to do uh, original language exegesis, you know, Hebrew or Greek, so that you may somehow be able to unearth some colors there in the story that may not be so uh, obvious in the English text. Uh, but of course, be careful that you don't try to make the impression that uh, it's only you can know these things. Okay, that's the uh, temptation for those who study in seminary. You would say things like, well, you know, in the Greek, which you don't know. <laughs> you know and in the Hebrew, which, I mean, uh, yours truly know, and uh, ignorant. So don't make that kind of impression, all right? That's the danger, all right? So avoid that as much as possible. In fact, if there's a, um, like, a, you know, an original language insight, what I normally try to do is I try to quote another English uh, translation to help me out. I would say, you know, in the message, it is translated like this. And, and the message means they can also access it. They, they can also read it from that translation. But it's helpful. Or I could say, you know, in the uh, King James, or, you know, the Living Translation says this. So it's better to use that if it helps me in trying to bring out the original language behind it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And there are so many translations, like J.B. Phillips, so, uh, you know, uh, West, uh, West, uh, West Mall, I forgot the type of translation. But there are so many translations out there. In fact, it's funny, you know, I, I was in a bookstore one time, and there was a group of Mormons who were looking at the Bible section, you know, and they were laughing, and I was like, look at these Christians, they have so many translations. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just couldn't help but laugh, you know. So, all right, so these are ignorant people. <laughs> so, uh, number three, all right, what is number three? The overall development may us be adaptive and adaptive, or Mm -hmm. 
enlarging portions are used for illustration and indirect application in modeling. All right. Now, you know, it's, it's always tempting when you're preaching to uh, generalize, you know, you say things like, well, you know, I, I know so many people like this. <laughs> you know, and you begin to say, you know, there's so many bad people out there in the world. You know, it's a general statement like that. Uh, it would be better for you to zero in on one particular incident, maybe one particular person, okay, without necessarily naming that person, okay? Because, uh, uh, well, how do you do this? You know, sometimes uh, I, I tell a story uh, involving real people in my audience, people I know. Now, how do you how do you do that without putting them into spotlight? <coughs> Ask them in advance. Okay, that's one way. Can I use an illustration? You know, I'm going to make a fool of you. Is that okay? <laughs> 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 I'm going to make you look bad. <laughs> no, really. Uh, what are some guidelines that you've done yourself in your preaching? Anyone can suggest for uh, the benefit of the class? Yeah, you involve yourself. You involve yourself yeah. in the story. In the story. Yeah. So you make yourself look bad. You know, or make yourself look yeah, yeah. like a fool. Yeah. Don't make other people look like a fool. Yeah. You know? yeah. Make yourself look like a fool. It's okay. What else? I, I remember one time uh, about the narrative. Mm -hmm. It's not me, but I heard something about mm -hmm. the tone and the tension. The tone and? The tension. The tension. The tension. The tone means, I mean, the narrative, when it goes like Samaritan woman, uh -huh. when she said, like, give me water, okay. I remember from uh, Raymond Chan. Uh, Raymond Chan? Raymond Chan? Raymond Chan. Yeah. The, the way how, I mean, <laughs> I'm really confused with the name. Give me water, when she said, give me water, what kind of tone she used. Uh, give me water. Give me water. Or give me what water. he doesn't say. <laughs> you know, give me water or something like that. Right. So we can really relate. Yeah, that's that's good. That's very creative. You know. Uh, well, yeah. That's more like when you're telling a story, especially uh, when there is dialogue. You really don't know what the tone of voice is. Okay. So you can make certain kinds of uh, uh, you know tone, uh, tones, uh, and and that would be very entertaining, of course. Uh, but uh, again, the text will limit you as to what would be allowable. Uh, anyway, when I, what I do is uh, I try to combine uh, elements of different people that I've met and create, you know, uh, <coughs> another kind of, uh, without telling that this is a particular person. I try to, it's what you call a non-story, because uh, when you are, uh, it could be your story, when you're, when you're saying it could be your story, it could be someone, uh, else's, uh, sorry, someone uh, else's story, or it could be no one's story. Uh, like parables, like, uh, you know, make up stories, you know. What's there with this person? So that's a, a <laughs> that's a parable, or that, that's a, like an illustration, say, you know, once I, I, I you know, what's there with this person? And you describe, and you use different elements of people's experiences to form that story. So you're not really referring to a particular person. Now when you say, I have a friend, you know, then there's someone else's story. You know, or I, I met my classmate, you know, now you have to be uh, precise about that because maybe your classmate is sitting there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> your, your friend is just listening to you. So you, you he may he may confront you and say, you're not telling the truth about me, okay? Uh, some guideline there. We talked about that, those things in preaching one. Four, number four, please. If the applications are left indirect in the main volumes, the final section sum up, summarizing, reviewing the applications from each point may then offer a direct action point for a strong call to action. Alright. Uh, it's quite challenging to try to reverse the useful uh, style that you do when you're doing preaching one, right? In preaching one, you say the point first. Okay, and then you try to prove it from the text. That's usually the, the sequence. And then you try to explain that point. And you can explain it in many different ways, okay? And then you try to uh, apply that, okay, to, the, to your audience. Now others may just reverse that or, or say prove first, you know. Uh, but usually you start with a point and then you go this way, right? Uh, now, what about not saying the point, but 
starting first with some kind of uh, explanation and then moving into the text and then you go to the application or something, some kind of variation, okay, in terms of the sequence you know, of, of what you're going to say. Yeah? That's quite challenging, all right? That's quite challenging uh, to think about. Uh, but it can be done, all right? So in preaching one, you can be more creative instead of just normally, okay, first point, okay? Uh, what are the challenges of evangelism? Number one, okay, whatever that is. Okay, and then you prove and explain, etc. Okay, so let's go to letter B now. Uh, narrative structure, which is now preaching too. We may utilize didactic or teaching or application uh, in our sermons. Number one. Number one, contemporary production may raise the real need in offer transition into the biblical setting. The setting is unfolded to demonstrate parallels to contemporary setting. All right. Now, please remember when you're preaching that. Uh, your audience may not necessarily have the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, interest and awareness of the the full implications of the passage that you are going to preach on. It's not like you, okay? If, if you've been studying your passage, you're quite excited about it. You're so full of uh, insight concerning it, you know, and so forth. Please remember when you actually preach, uh, people who are listening to you do not have that kind of experience. And the reason why I'm belaboring that is because sometimes you immediately assume that they were with you when you were studying. All right? So you tend to just jump into, you know, whatever it is that you want to say without really engaging uh, your audience at that point in time. So really what is important is not to get stuck with your outline, but to look at people's eyes and to see whether they're in fact engaging with you or not. You know what I'm saying? You have to internal, internalize your message to the point that you can actually leave the pulpit for a second and look at the audience and be able to maybe make corrections midway or change your face midway or, or maybe say something else that you did not prepare simply because of the way that you see the audience responding to it. You know what I'm saying? That's the dynamic of preaching. When you come up with an outline, don't get stuck with it. Like You insist on the outline even though people are just dying, falling, you know, <laughs> drooling in their mouth. They're, they're not engaging with you. You're still persisting in your outline. You know, there may be times that you really have to just forget the outline because it's not it's not there, you know. What if somebody just shoots somebody in the middle of the ser service, right? <laughs> so now you go, okay, never, never mind the person dying over there. Let's just move on to point number two. You cannot do that, right? You just, just you, you prepare the outline for the sake of being prepared but not for the sake of being limited. Because when you're out there in the preaching moment, God wants to speak and He needs you to be attentive enough to what His Spirit may want to say at that very moment. Which, of course, I hope it doesn't happen all the time because it can be very unnerving. All right? You prepare and then just before you talk, the Spirit of God says, I don't want to say that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that that's quite unnerving. You know, like you're perspiring. You know, what, what do you do, right? Especially for those who are not so... You know, for people who are pneumophobias, you know, with the pneumophobia, you, you, whenever there's the Holy Spirit involved, don't like, to, you know, get away from me, you know. This. Anyway, so, Pentecostal people are not like that, right? It's full of the Spirit. Anyway, so, uh, the point is, uh, you know, we're so, when you're so stuck with the outline, you, you, just, you just fail to communicate. Because communicating is not just saying words, it's a... Uh, Helping the other person to, uh, to see and understand the meaning that is in your mind so that he or she also knows or sees the meaning in his own mind so that your mind is correct. Communication is not just saying words. It has, to, it has to do with connecting each other's meaning so that you understand each other. Alright? So that's why when you're preaching, you do a lot of looking and listening. Okay? When a person... Uh, somebody, when you're speaking, when the person does this, and you're preaching and you don't notice that, all right, uh, you may fail to connect with that person. I don't mean to say that you get paranoid, like, who among you are just crossing your hands, you know? <laughs> but uh, you kind of be sensitive with different responses of people, right? <laughs> 
Number two, let's go to number two. So much for that. Okay, number two. Who's the next person who's going to, yeah, stay here. Uh, the narrative takes over, presuming <coughs> the narrative moves or scenes or acts. Leaving the sermon, the narrative starts. All right, okay. Now, you know, in preaching too, we're trying to train you to try to uh, uh, just tell the, the movement of the story in the most natural way, as the text itself says it, you know, without spoiling the, the climax, you know, uh, without telling both the audience. You know, the reason why he did this is because, here's the point, you know, and you're just starting with the story, so you tell the point, and say people, people would say, okay, I know the point, now can I go home? Because <laughs> I know the point. Here's, you've got to resist that because we have the tendency, you know, as uh, teachers of the word, to try to just clarify things too soon. You understand what I'm saying? Huh? So I'm measuring the story, and you know, because you've read the entire story, right? So in the middle of the, just when the setting was just being given, or maybe the initial character is being described, you go ahead and tell, you know, you read the reason why David did this. And you tell it. You just spoil the story. Because now people are no longer interested to know what happened next. Okay, so you've got to resist that temptation. Number three. Inductive development of meaning and application of words in each scene up. Once the meaning application is developed inductively, a great pause zoom out for deductive summary and application is made. Then the next scene up begins zoom in. All right. Now, I, I would not necessarily agree totally with that, okay? Because uh, that's the common temptation when people handle narratives. They, they think you have to say something after each paragraph or after each uh, dialogue, and then you're supposed to, you know, give a meaning to that, a lesson, so to speak, and then move on to the next one, then another lesson. That's why coming up with uh, with points when you're trying to preach from a narrative, for me it's quite unnatural. That's my personal opinion, alright? Because I think you've got to let the story unfold. It's like when you're watching, uh, when you watch a movie rather, uh, you really don't pause each time the movie, you know, just pause, okay, let's just talk about it, you know, and, and don't, don't do that, right? You let the whole story just finish. And then at the end of it, when you're walking and you're about to go to McDonald's, you talk about the story. And you talk about all the lessons that you learned from the story. Isn't that what we normally do? Right? Or we, we highlight some episodes in the story as we remember them. And we talk about it. Say, remember that particular scene? Yeah, I like that scene. You know? And, and, you go, and on and on it goes. So you don't really pause within the story itself. So it's quite challenging, uh, especially when you're dealing with a long story. That's a bit... Uh, difficult okay so yes there may be times where I would agree that you may have to stop or pause for a while to try to give some kind of didactic didactic sense to it you know what I'm saying but not to the point that you actually spoil the next turn of events remember that don't do that if you're going to say something in the middle of the story avoid the feeling that the story is already resolved because once you do that the plot is over remember what plot is what is plot? Conflict. Yeah, it's basically about conflict. Basically about this unresolved issue in the story. So don't try to resolve it. Because every time you resolve it and you do not re re recreate a new conflict, you just lose your audience. You follow that? Whenever you try to, you know, resolve an issue, you know, why is this character doing this or etc. And you try to give an answer to that, you just resolve the feeling. The feeling that, you know, <coughs> what is going to happen? And then you tell them, ah, okay. So you begin to relax, right? So you can only do that if after resolving it, you bring up another issue that creates another conflict. Then you sustain again the interest. Alright? That's why in deductive sermons, the reason why it tends to be boring is because oftentimes you have to say the preaching idea right up front in the introduction. And so that gives away, you know, so to speak, the main thing about the message. So when you say, today I want to teach you preaching idea. Okay? God is good. So everybody said, okay, God is good. God is good. You know, so, so they know God is good. That's the main point. And so now everybody is just waiting for you to finish. They're, 
you know, playing with their cell phones, you know, because they know the message. God is good. You know? <laughs> what else can they wait for, right? So deductive sermons can th- can be like that. They can be very boring. And then you say, I'm going to tell you three things today. Okay, uh, I'm going to tell you uh, that, uh, the the reasons why uh, uh, you know God does not answer prayers is reason one, two, and three. All right. So let's go into that. You know what happens to my mind? I'm not interested anymore because I already jumped down the three things. So in deductive preaching, it's quite challenging. Now in inductive preaching, it's the other way around. Sometimes you can go on and on with the story, and people are like this and like. <laughs> so they they ask you like, what 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 is the point? You know like. Because you're going to the store, you know, and there was this thing that happened, and this thing that happened again, and so many things were happening, my goodness, you know. One thing happened, you know, and the next thing happened, and they're saying, yeah, so many things are happening, you know. Can you please pause and let us understand what's going on? So that's the challenge of preaching narratives, okay? Because when do you do that without spoiling the fun, okay? When do you do it, and how do you do it in such a way that they don't, Get disinterested. Okay? Alright, let's continue. Number four. Now, you know, the, the, the way that I uh, see this being done is, you know, you, you, uh, you, make, you take a, uh, a back, uh, uh, what do you call that in narrative preaching? Wherein you go back to a, an incident or in the past, which is not in the story, and you try to give, uh, like, a, a information about this. And, uh, what do you call that? Anybody can remember? What it is? Remembering something in the past. Flashback. Okay, sorry. Flashback. See? Thank you. Flashback. So basically, you cause the character or you tell the character in such a way that he flashes back to an incident maybe a few chapters before. Mm-hmm. Where you don't have to tell this, we don't have to read it. All right? What I mean is you don't have to read the, the story again. If, for example, you're working on chapter 34 and there's something that happened in chapter 30, you don't want to go there in chapter 30 and say, let's open our Bible to chapter 30 because that will distract the audience from looking at chapter 34. So you stay in chapter 34 and you retell chapter 30 using a flashback approach. In other words, you're pausing for a while and you're saying, please understand why this character said this. Let's just think for a moment. See, ha- something happened. When he said this, he was thinking of this incident. Now you talk about chapter 30. Alright? So remember, whenever you try to read something, it just takes a long time. Huh? That's the challenge of narratives. Because you have to read. Uh, some text, right? And if it's a long story, it just, it just take a long time. Yes. Uh, I'm just thinking of about narrative because most of our narratives are familiar with the okay, yeah. mm. audience. So mm. when we present, like you're saying, you should not put the preaching idea to be at the end. Mm. So it seems like people will get bored because they know the story already and waiting for 25 minutes or 30 minutes and give the application of the well, that would happen if you're just plainly just describing a story, like you're just retelling us in a normal way, because we already know that. But if you can retell the story in a way that is vivid, it comes alive, and there, you know, it, it just yeah. makes some contemporary allusions to it, so that, you know, instead of just saying uh, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, they went to the marketplace, or you can say they went to McDonald's, you know, it's just, they just, just, you know, make that story come alive. That, that would be interesting, even though I know it. For example, uh, when you, when, when, uh, when people watch Spider-Man or any of the Marvel stories, well, they didn't know what those things were, be, basically. All right, uh, right. I mean, if, when, when, when you, when you watch some of these Marvel stories, those of you from my era, I think. <laughs> <laughs> or in my case, anyway, I know those things, right? I, I know Captain America, you know, during my time. Right? Anyway, my point is I know already the story. Even before I went to the to the movie house, I already know the story. So why do I go to the movie house? I want to know the fresh way that they're going to tell the story. Snow White. I know Snow White, you know. I know. I know. <laughs> so, I, you know, my friend brought me to watch it. So weird, you know, it's a, it's a weird kind of a Snow White. You know? 
Snow White? I'm thinking of Snow White in a different way, you know, it's just a paradigm shift, okay? Okay, uh, so yeah, you can, some stories like Goliath, you know, stuff like that, people know these things. But if you can tell them and focus on certain parts of the story that maybe people jump into, or create interest, like for example, today I'm going to talk to you about David and Goliath. And let me tell you something that you don't know about David and Goliath. Now you create interest. Right? Because if you do the telling us, you know, once upon a time there was a giant and there is five stones and he threw it and he died. <laughs> <laughs> and he's dead, okay? So you better figure out how to tell a familiar story in such a way that becomes interesting. Get the point? Alright? That's a challenge for familiar stories. And uh, that's why I would uh, recommend those of you who are working on Old Testament Latin narratives right now to really try your hand on some unfamiliar stories. Okay? Familiar stories are good to preach on actually, uh, or, you know, I mean, because they're quite uh, familiar. And so it maybe it would shorten the time of studying. Uh, but then it can be very tempting also, because when you're working on a familiar th- story, you think you already know the story. That's the problem. Right? If you're working on David and Goliath, guess what? You know, how many sermons have you heard about David and Goliath? So you would approach it, and you know, the, the last sermon is still ringing in your ear, ears, you know? The, the, the last sermon syndrome, LSS, you know? The last sermon syndrome, you know? I remember what uh, Edmund Chan said about this, you know, so you can ask me out of it. All right, take a break, and we'll talk more about it. So, uh, before we hear the next bell, uh, there's some just, uh, just uh, administrative things here. We are going to start uh, our sermon lab on July uh, 13. So, uh, instead of having a class called Exegeting New Testament Narratives, we are going to start our preaching lab there because we need three uh, sessions for our preaching lab because of the number of students we have here. Okay? So July 13, uh, 18, and 20 will be the preaching labs. So July 13, uh, 18, and then uh, 20. You got that? July 18, 20. All right. And then uh, Pastor Raymond will be dividing you all of you into three groups so there will be three different classes or laboratories for preaching each class would have about eight or nine students each all of you should be there regardless whether you're the one preaching or not okay you should be there in your class assignment so it will still be first block okay but there will be three classrooms where we will have our labs okay each, uh, in, each, in each lab, two people will preach for each lab, okay? So the first hour, second hour. So that will give ample time for feedback and for evaluation, okay? Yeah, the preaching itself should be about 20 or, you know, maximum 30 minutes, all right? But try your best to make it 20 minutes, okay? Uh, we, you can go as far as 30, but don't go beyond that, otherwise you will sacrifice the evaluation period because we are only allotting uh, an hour for each student. You got that? So for those of you who just came in, our preaching lab will be uh, will start on uh, July uh, 13, 18, and also uh, 20. Okay? July 13, 18, and 20. So instead of the uh, exegeting New Testament narratives class, we're going to start with preaching lab there and move that particular class uh, exegeting New Testament narratives after the preaching lab. Okay? So we'll probably cover now, July, now it's June 27. Yeah? And so up to next uh, week, which is July 6. Because we don't have a class this Friday, right? So July 6, Wednesday, we'll be continuing on with our discussion on narrative preaching techniques and options and then hopefully also workshop uh, as we 
finish that. Okay. Do you have any questions? Do you need to submit your homiletical worksheets and outline? Well, it's not, so, it's, it's not so much the need, but uh, you know, it would be quite advantageous if you can submit it early so that I can look into it. Otherwise, you know, as you well know, I'm in ministry also, so uh, sometimes I don't have enough time. So if you can give it to me uh, way in advance, I can look into it, I can give you a feedback. If we do the work yesterday, then it would be helpful for us to make this community. Right, I think so. The earlier the better, I think, you know. But uh, the, the, the schedule is there, okay, for you. So uh, uh, at the very least, you need to submit that by July 11th. Uh, that'll be quite late already, but... Uh, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be... Which one? The worksheets. He's talking about the homiletical worksheets. Yes, July 6th. July 6th. Oh, sorry, July 6th, yeah, July 6th. I'm saying that he, he, they can submit up to July 11 because we're delayed in our lecture. But ideally, he should submit that as early as possible. If it can be done, okay? So I'll try to finish the SDGs worksheets today. So I'll work on it so that I can give it up to you in your boxes uh, before the day is over, okay? Pray for me. It's too much, you know, there's a lot, you know, single space, my goodness, it's like reading uh, my doctoral dissertation. Anyway, so, question, do you have questions? No? All right, can we move on? Is everything, everyone, everyone is clear about uh, this thing, talking about? Okay then, yeah. Why are you covering your mouth? Well, uh, are you sick or? Yeah. You are? Okay. Uh, I thought you wanted to be a doctor, you know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was telling this, like, last time we had done work on that, so the similar way that if we uh, focus on our work so far, so we can do things, that will be a surprise to me. So, yes, um, I'll do my very best. Okay? <laughs> Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about, uh, well we still have number five here, the climactic statement of the theological significance of the narrative applied, which is what the preaching idea is all about, might also be set in a reflective epilogue to the narrative. What does that mean? It means you are basically just pausing after all the storytelling and then making like a summary of the story. Now, Jack Swindoll loves to do that. Jack Swindoll's technique is like that, okay? He tells the story vividly, you know, with details and all of that. He tells the story. And then at the end of the story, he would say, I could see three things here. One, two, three. That's what he does. So he doesn't give the one, two, three points in the story. He tells the story, gives enough background and understanding to the story, provides me with <coughs> certain words, you know, and then at the end of it, he, he concludes with an epilogue and says, you know, based on the story, I think I can come up with you know, three ideas or two thoughts about, you know, what it means to trust God. And then he goes on. So that's Chuck Swindoll's style. Okay? By the way, that's a good thing for you to do. Uh, you know, to research some uh, narrative preaching, you know, look for maybe in YouTube or somewhere you can look for Eugene Lowry or somebody, you know, that was very good in uh, narrative preaching. And listen to how it's done. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to learn? It's just to listen to some people who do that. Okay. I don't know if we have this in our library, but I think we do. Uh, I think we have some uh, sermons by uh, Robinson and others, okay, mm -hmm. using a narrative approach. So check it with the librarian, okay, and mm -hmm. see if we still have those uh, CDs. Uh, Okay, guidelines for narrative outlining uh, choices. Uh, where the turn occurs will help determine which narrative sermon model the preacher will use. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, basically, as you look into the story, of course, one thing will stand out in the story. Uh, you know, you would notice that there is a, a problem. Okay? There is a, a, an unresolved issue that the story brings up, okay? And as you look into the story, 
uh, you may discover that the resolution to that problem may be in the story itself, or it could be further down, you know, after the story. It could even be further, further down, you know, like in the time of Christ, the resolution, okay? Or it could be something before that. So in other words, he's talking about the third. The third is the resolution. The solution to the, to the conflict. Follow me? In other words, as you are studying the text, you are trying to look for the answer or solution to the problem. Okay? So there is a problem. Alright? So where is the solution? That's the key. This is called third. Okay. As you look at the story and study it, one thing will, you know, uh, come across as you're looking into it is it, what is the, uh, uh, what Lauri's term for that? Uh, the focus. It's calling it the focus. Okay? <coughs> the focus. So, <coughs> this is called the focus. So, he's using a different term. But basically what he means by focus is that Here's the problem, okay? Here's the problem, okay? Uh, how can Abraham trust the Lord, okay, in spite of the long delay? What's the key here? What, what was God teaching him? Well, that's the solution, all right? How could he accomplish <coughs> God's will in his life, okay? Now that Hagar try to come into the picture, you know, how can God's purpose now be fulfilled? Mm -hmm. That was the problem. What is the solution? Okay? So there is always a problem in, a, in every story. Sometimes the problem may not be so obvious. And that's why you have to do some digging in the story for you to get into the, the problem of the text. Okay? But that's, that's usually the most challenging part. <laughs> and it's not very challenging to check the meaning of a Hebrew word. Okay? You, you use a tool to do that. Okay? Uh, try to understand the grammar of a certain sentence, okay? Or whatever, okay? Those are easy things because you, you always have tools to do that. The difficult thing is to try to uh, identify what is the problem that is being raised up in this story. What issue, what, what unresolved uh, goal or intention is not <coughs> being fulfilled here? Maybe it has to do with God's goal for that character. Maybe it has to do with uh, his own faith, you know, how he can trust God, so whatever. It may be something there. So, work on that. That's the hard part. That's what you pray for. That you spend, you spend time in prayer for that. <coughs> okay? After, after doing the spade work for you. So, as you try to do that. Okay? Remember? Okay? You're trying to move to that. Trying to understand it. Okay, what, what, is, what is the situation? Alright, do you have any questions about that? Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I, okay, you may not know exactly what I'm <laughs> saying, but I hope you understand it. Okay. Now, uh, the sermonic model chosen is partially determined by where the turn, of course, occurs in the biblical story. And it is partly determined by how directly the biblical story relates to the audience's uh, felt need. In other words, the kind of outlining that you will choose will largely depend on where the turn can be discovered. Again, sometimes the turn is in the story itself, which is good. In other words, by the end of the story, the conflict <coughs> is resolved. So praise the Lord for that. Amen? That's a hallelujah story. In other words, there was a problem in the beginning, and then by the end of the story, everything is resolved. Everybody goes home, they live happily ever after. Okay? But there are stories, and there are many like that, those, in, in Genesis in particular, wherein there is a conflict, and then the, the scene ends, and it doesn't resolve the problem. And you're wondering, when, when, when is it going to be resolved? Maybe it will be resolved far, far later on in the narrative. Not exactly in your particular passage. You got that? That's the challenge there, right? Don't force it. Not all stories, remember there's a larger story, and then within this larger story, there's episodes or scenes. Alright? 
So don't force it because you know when you're working on a particular chapter maybe, you're just working on a scene. <coughs> a scene in a person's life. An episode. Right? And as you look into it, maybe right there in that particular episode there is a resolution to a mini problem. Okay? But maybe there is a major one that is yet to be resolved. It can only be resolved in chapter 50 of Genesis. Okay, not necessarily in that particular episode. So you need to have a broad understanding of the story, as well as a you know macro view of the, the episode itself. Okay, so this requires exegetical skill. All right, what are the different alternatives? First is what you call the running the story, okay, or pure narrative, as sometimes it is called. When the focus, problem, and turn or solution are found in the text together. Here we begin in, stay in, and end the story. Only brief allusions are made to contemporary parallel situations for application. So this is the basic, most normal way of telling a story whenever the turn is actually found in the story itself. New Testament is very much like that. Okay? New Testament stories are a lot easier to, to handle because the resolution is oftentimes at the end or maybe Jesus would actually say something like you know, uh, those are first or the last and the last of the first. So he actually gives a summary principle at the end of an incident, you know, or a story. But Old Testament may be harder because sometimes you don't have the resolution within the text. So first try to look for that. If you can find a solution to the problem within the text, you have a, what you call a running the story kind of story. So all you have to do is just simply retell the story. Amen? Yeah, go ahead. So in this case, there's uh, no need anymore for a contemporary introduction. Well, you may still need to do that in order to raise up the, the issue or the topic, or shall I say, to, to at least introduce the story before you dive into the story. But that's optional, right? Uh, but seldom do we actually start with the story immediately. Like, uh, you know, you read immediately the text, then you dive into the story itself. Usually you have some kind of intro. Okay, the, the usual. The usual outline of sermons would be uh, we have the title, okay, the text, okay, and then you have the uh, the, uh, the take home message. This is for you. This this is not for the audience. This is for you. Then and then you have the talk itself, okay, which is your outline, okay. So the talk usually you have a, a take off. And then you have a teaching portion, and then you have a touchdown. So, uh, sorry about that. I'm from IGSL, so that's why I'm like that. Uh, basically, this is the normal thing. We call this intro, body, conclusion, all right? But I don't like those words because they don't start with T, you know? I like everything that starts with T, okay? <laughs> so that's your talk. So basically, this is uh, how your outline looks like. You have a title, you have a text, you have a take a take message, and you have a talk. Alright? Uh, that's for your notes. Alright? And then, uh, in a narrative preaching, your teaching, alright, it depends. If you're doing didactic, your teaching will, will be you will have a controlling question, and then you have a point name. And then you have point one, two, three, all right? That's the normal preaching one. In preaching two narratives, you you may not you may not have a point name, all right? Usually you don't have a point name, okay? Now, you may have a controlling question. You may have a controlling question. Basically, a controlling question is a topical question. For example, uh, it's a contemporary question. Like, what do you do when your prayers are not being answered? And how do we respond to situations where God does not answer our prayers? Let's look into our story right now. You know, so there's a controlling question that controls the entire sermon. That is the question you want answered. Okay? And the story will be the vehicle. Now, when you're doing narrative straight not uh, storytelling, you've got to do it in terms of moves, okay, or movement. So you can have a, a, a 
scenes, all right? Uh, that's another one, like scene one, scene two. You know what a scene one, scene two is? There's a particular situation and place and time where there's a, a character or characters involved, okay? Something happens there and it moves to the next scene. Something happens. Now in some stories, <coughs> one scene, one place, the character is there all throughout until the story is ended. <coughs> There's a sort of one scene kind of story. Okay, that they don't change places. For example, we are here in this classroom. Okay, <coughs> and everything that's happened here is what the story is all about. Now, when we go to, con to the canteen or let's go outside and I talk with you one by one, it's a different scene because we changed in a, a place. Sure. All right. So when you're looking at a story. If you just check whether the scenes are changing, whether there's a new there's a new place, maybe there are now new characters, you know. For example, there will be a battle in some place, and then there will be a conversation in another place. So that's a different scene. So you decide your talk in terms of movements, okay? Uh, because it could be scenes, it could be ideas that is moving along, all right? You can be using ideas as a way to guide you, okay? Or it, it could be in terms of time. It could be in terms of uh, location. So there are many different ways of trying to guide you into the story, all right? So that when you're telling... Now, here's the, here's the problem. When you're retelling the story, what you don't want to do is read the text just as it is, okay? You've got to engage with the audience or use uh, eye contact because if you're just reading the text, the audience will just fall asleep, right? So you may have, you, what you can do is focus on a particular uh, development in the story and then come out of it for a second and just engage with the people, helping them to understand that particular part without necessarily resolving the problem. You got that? And then moving on back to the story again. Okay. Now, can you jump paragraphs when you're retelling the story? Can you say, let's go to the next paragraph? No. All right. It would depend after. Right? It would depend. No? Uh, it depends on what? It depends on the time that you have. It depends on the you know, some considerations that you have, right? Uh, whether the audience is really familiar with that part, okay? And whether you think that you can actually just maybe retell that part without, you know, sacrificing integrity. <laughs> but then if it's not possible, then you really have to read the, the paradigm. Right? You really have to go and stick with the story. Now, this is workable, especially when the story is not that long. Huh? When you have a story that's about two or three chapters, boy, you know, that's hard. Mm -hmm. that's so, yeah, what you can do is just say, you know what, this is a long story. So today I'm just going to talk about the first part. <laughs> first something to that effect, okay? Because it's, it's, if you try to summarize it, you, you may be tempted to just skip some important aspects of the story. So again, that's a, a judgment call on your part, okay? But it's, uh, it's going to be, that's the usual, normal way of doing it, running the story, okay? It's called running the story. Okay, the next one, uh, delaying the story. Uh, when the focus problem is best portrayed by, from a contemporary perspective first, this may be because the focus is not as clearly developed in the text as needed to impact the audience, or it may be or it may, because, it may be because the text story is too well known and carries too many assumptions. And so in that case, you take off, all right, with a contemporary illustration or story that somehow raises up the problem or focus in a way that would really engage the audience. And then you retell the story in the teaching part, okay? So that's an option, delaying the story. In other words, you're not immediately going to dive into the story. You're going to start with a controlling question, like how do you deal with, you know, delays and so forth. I remember a particular incident that happened to me years ago. 
and then you tell that story. And as you tell that story, you raise up the issue. So you basically started. Now remember, when you raise up the issue, you should not resolve the issue. You follow me? In delaying the story, you do the, the story will resolve the issue. So you do not resolve the issue in your introduction. So you don't say like, you know, and so I was really waiting for God to answer my prayer until finally I just learned, okay, I just learned that it's not up to me to control the future. It's up to God. What did you just do? You resolved it. <laughs> the story is now anticlimactic. No need for the story anymore. You got that? So in delaying the story, you do not, you, you start with a contemporary story and then you retell the biblical story. That's the start, the technique there. You got that? But when you are telling the contemporary story, please do not give the, the main idea the story. You have to just, like in drama skits. How many of you use drama skits in church? Or some of you do not, alright? Drama skits can be an effective tool, alright, for raising up an issue. So that when you actually preach, you become the solution to the drama skit. But some drama skits, they do it in the wrong way. They come up with a drama skit that basically ends happily, you know. The key to drama skit is to end with a hanging kind of feeling. At the end of the skit, you're just wondering and asking questions in your mind. That's the best kind of skit. Alright? So it's not a full-blown kind of dramatization. Like Joseph the Dreamer, you know. <laughs> it's a full-blown thing. Huh? No, you, you, a skip is you raise up, there is some, there is some, there's a storyline, but then it is not resolved. And so you come up and you preach. So it's the same thing. It's like delaying the story. Okay? The difference is that the contemporary story is done using a skip rather than you yourself telling a story. Or you can use a video. That's another way of delaying the story. Okay? You show a video of a particular thing that focuses on a problem and then it's not resolved. And then you come up and you preach the story. Again, that's another option. You got that? So it's not just ne necessarily you the one talking. There are many different ways of trying to do that. Uh, third is uh, suspending the story. Okay, who's, who's the one reading? Where did we stop? Okay. Can you read that? When the focus problem of the story is not clearly solved by the information in the text story, the third solution may be found from information outside the text itself. The conclusion refers to the yes. story. Alright, so in this case, you start with the story, you probably even finish with the story, but you are left with an unresolved issue. You follow me? So you go through the story, you even finish the whole thing, the whole chapter maybe, or the whole incident, but the question is left hanging. There's no solution. In that case, you are now forced to go to another text, or another passage, or another chapter, or even in the New Testament, <coughs> to try to resolve the matter. Okay? Otherwise, the feeling will still be unresolved. And don't be surprised by this, because the meta-narrative of the Bible is that everything else is answered in Christ. The whole, the whole dilemma of sin and, you know, and, and all of that problem is eventually answered in Christ. So that is not a surprising thing for us. It's just that you have to make a judgment call when you're exegeting the text. Would it be helpful to jump all the way to the New Testament to try to resolve this issue? Alright? Or could I just simply go to one of the previous passages of this story? Or maybe just go further the next chapter or two chapters from here? to try to resolve the matter. So, as I do so, I refer back to the story. So this, again, is an option. Okay, we're talking about outlining options. Okay? Now, when you're outlining, most of you probably would write it down. Amen? When you're outlining, most of you would write it down. Uh, I would suggest that you do your best to internalize your outline so that all you're holding is your Bible as much as possible. Okay? So that you don't have to look at your notes. That's the idea. I'm not requiring it, but I'm just saying, you know, step out of the boat, walk on the water, 
and fly in the sky, you know, so just, yeah, just go beyond your comfort zone. I know all of you are just used to, you know, you just love the pulpit, you know, even if you want to go, you know, and stay there, you know, you can't eat back home, you know, but you've got to get out of that and just preach from your Bible, if necessary. Stay with your eye contact, know your outline well, by heart. If you can do that... How about no Bible preach? Well, that would be great, you know, if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> just recite it, you know, from memory. Okay, alternating the story. That's the fourth option. <coughs> Who is the next one going to read that? Yes. Alternating the story. When multiple transitions out of and into the text are needed to heighten, heighten focus or tension, as well as understanding, also suggested when the term solution is not clearly found in the text directly, mm -hmm. but must be supplied by a logical argument from from a wider theological context. All right. So in this case, you find that uh, in order to really develop the tension of the conflict, you may have to go in and out. You know, into the story, into the contemporary scene. You know, into the story, into the contemporary problem. Okay, and maybe making a more a wider kind of understanding about the story in view of the Old Testament, in view of the Old Bible. You know, trying to just help the people really grasp the impact of the story. Because the story itself does not give us sufficient information for us to be able to understand its meaning. So that's why I challenge you, okay, when you, when you do that. All right? But most, of, most often, after you do that, without even thinking about it. Because when you're reading the story, of course, you have to supply some additional insight or information that maybe the text doesn't say, but it's important for understanding. Because remember, you know, most of the people who are sitting in the pew may not have the kind of theological paradigm as you have, right? Because you, you've been doing this, like for a living, you know? So <laughs> others are, you know, just basically just dabbling into the Bible, you know, every now and then, you know? Or maybe just reading daily bread, you know? So when you're, when you're teaching, you've got to help them understand, right, uh, the theology behind it. Is there a, yeah. this where you look at commentaries there? Well, yeah, I always look at commentaries all the time whenever I'm working on a text. Right. It's part of my digging. How do you, like, uh, balance it that you don't become a running commentary? Well, yeah, you've got to keep in mind the, the focus of the story and the solution so that you always go back to it. Otherwise, there's, you're always tempted to say something. You see, in this particular verse, you see, uh, uh, David trusted God. I mean, we should trust God, right? You know? And then here, I mean, he killed Goliath. We should all kill people, you know? <laughs> we just go on and make applications along the way. That's called running commentary without a focus. So that's why when you preach from an hour, you talk from any kind of preaching, you need to have a focus. That's why controlling question is very important, okay? Rating of the issue, like, you know, you know I, 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 I struggle in, in trying to uh, not do what I know I should not be doing, but it just, I just keep on falling in, a, in that area. I mean, how do I gain victory in this area? What am I doing? I'm raising the issue. At all. I mean, how, how do we as believers in Christ really be able to live victoriously and not, you know, go into cycles? What's the key? What am I doing? Raising up the pop. Alright? And so when I say, let's go into this particular story because this story, I believe, really highlights for us the key and the solution to this problem. What am I doing? I'm focusing everyone <coughs> to the story. And so as I go into the story and as I retell the story, I keep coming back to that theme. I keep coming back to the question. And I say, so how? I mean, how do we do this? It seems like this character did this, this character did that, but does that solve our problem? I don't think so. So you move on to the story, move on to the story. And then finally at the end of the story, if it is a running the story kind of outlining, all right? At the end of the story you say, you see, here's what happens. David, Abraham, whatever, whoever, <laughs> finally realized this important thing. You see, the only way you can have victory in your life is this. The story is there, the point is there, the whole thing is that drives you. Alright? So that's how you keep your focus. And that's how you avoid being a running commentator. 
know exactly what your focus is. What is the problem? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Will the story resolve it? Or will the story just heighten the problem and the solution is somewhere else? Solution means third. The third is somewhere else. You got? So basically the question is, what is the problem and where do I find the solution? Amen? That's bottom line. What is the problem? Is, is the problem in the story uh, is the, is the, or is the solution in the story rather than the problem? In other words, you're looking at a story that resolves a problem that happens much earlier than your story. Okay? Alright. Did you get that? Huh? I know you didn't really fully get that, but it's okay, you know. You're, you're just doing, you're just nodding your head to make me happy. It's okay. So, preaching outline options for narratives. There's no one way to handle narrative text. By blending uh, deductive uh, and deductive elements, by blending storytelling and exhortation, the right mix may be found that suits text, audience, preacher, occasion, and place in the series. Here's my advice, okay? <coughs> Don't worry too much about what form should I, you know, should I use or whatever. That's really not the, the main thing. The main thing is that you have a message from the Lord that you have exegeted, all right, properly. You know, you've done biblical theology, you've done systematic theology or theologizing. You are now a principle that you believe God wants to say to the people. Now, be clear about that. Be clear. Be so clear about that. And then ask yourself a question. What is the best way for me to deliver that? This. <coughs> all right? How can I communicate this the best way? And then all the options will now be there, be available for you. And there are many different options. And there's no one single way. The Bible does not say, preach only this way and only this way or else you will suffer the fires of hell. There are many ways. Okay? Even, even a, a homily is a way of preaching. When I was younger, I used to think that homilies are very unbiblical because they're done by priests. <laughs> But I really like that the wrong attitude. Homily is one way of preaching. You know how homily is done? There's one thought, you tell a story. And another thought, the same thought, you go the same thought, you tell a story. And then the same thought, you tell a story. The same thought, you tell a story. And then you end, whenever you feel like ending. <laughs> That's a homily. <laughs> okay? There's just one idea, and you're just playing along with that idea. Try to come up with different stories or illustrations that support that idea. Or you just come, keep coming back to the idea. Have you listened to sermons like that? Huh? <laughs> and you find it so unbiblical, right? It's so <laughs> unevangelical. <laughs> but if the, if the point is well taken from a certain, sometimes they just use a verse, you know, I mean, it's okay. Now, the point is, uh, you know, there are many, many options. Don't get stuck with just one option. Like I told you, how many of you would be willing to use a drama skit to introduce a sermon? Would that be allowed in your church? Mm -hmm. Huh? That's good. All right, you can do that, right? Uh, or maybe you know you can be more daring. You can come into the pulpit dressed like David. You know? <laughs> then come out and put on <laughs> your fishing <laughs> shirt. That'll be quite quite daily. Okay. Anyway, uh, so there are many options. We move from the exegetical outline, uh, following the narrative movement of the text, to the theological outline, portraying the significance of each section as related to the meaning of the whole. To the homiletical outline, applying the meaning of each section in whole. To the audience. Now, this is presuming that you can actually do that in a story, meaning that you can actually come up with ideas for each section of the story. And you, I told you already how I feel about that. But sometimes you cannot do that. As you begin the setting, you may not be able to really come up with a particular homiletical idea about it, except it's a setting. <laughs> you know. So you can probably say in your outline. Setting. Okay, you introduce the setting, and then you know, first character comes in, you know, second character moves in. Okay, so doing this entails using clear structural markers or scene markers in the text 
to summarize the action, meaning of, and application of each section, faithfully following the order of the text. But when we move to the preaching outline of the sermon, we have a number of options. Each can stay true to the theological meaning and homiletical application of the text. But narrative texts offer creative possibilities especially suited to story preaching or narrative preaching. So we have some examples here. Non-narrative forms. Okay, letter A. Full story to principle to means. So how is it done? Introduction. Okay, contemporary need interest. Creatively retell the whole story with uh, an eye for identification by audience and then universal life principles stated from the from this story we see that so usually one point sermons are done like that okay now here he adds another transition to means this is the swindle approach okay main num main point number one cetera implication all of that Transition to main point number two, and then conclusion. So that, that's what you call the swindle approach. Okay, you retell the story, you come up with a uh, principle, and then you break it down into some kind of didactic form. Where right? you say there are two ideas, or there are three points other day. So you, it's like preaching one again. Okay, but you you, you try to uh, include a narrative approach. Okay? Let it be an option. Principle to means to segmented story. So number one is introduction. Okay, contemporary, need interest. In other words, focus, develop focus. Number two is universal life principle. In other words, you don't tell the story yet. Okay. And then letter A, main point, and then narrative section creatively retold. And then main point number two, narrative section creatively retold. In other words, this is like a deductive, inductive kind of approach. You tell the principle and then you state the point and then you use the story as proof text. Okay? That may be familiar to some of you, right? So in other words, you are coming up with a point to describe a section of the story. Again, for me, I don't do that normally. Okay, for the simple reason that I don't believe that normally, you know, sections of the story have a theological point. You know, it has to be the whole story. Okay, that's my personal opinion. But others can do that. Okay, I don't see any reason uh, why we should condemn people like that. <laughs> okay, alternating the story. All right, variation, suspending the story. So how is this done? Let us see. A uh, question to segmented story to means to principle. So, introduction. Okay. So, contemporary need or interest, etc. And then there is a strong main question or what? I call a controlling question. Okay. And then the question may be a what or why or a wha how, whatever. Okay, a, a question comes at a familiar story with fresh probing tension to grab mm -hmm. interest, etc. Mm -hmm. Then there are some questions, and then narrative create, uh, section creatively retold, and you move on to main point number one, two, three. And then you end up with the universal principle. Bottom line, there are many ways to skin a cat. Okay. There's not just one way to do this. Right, and then running the story, uh, delaying the story. All right, variety is delaying the story. So how do you do this? Letter D, segmented story to principle. I'm now in page six. Huh? segmented story to principle. So you start with an introduction. Then there are strong question that is given at the introduction, and then there is a narrative section creatively retold. Again, there is a question, you answer the question, and so forth, and so on, until you conclude with the story. Alright? And then you finally end with a universal principle, 
you know. You don't have to say all the time. From this story, we see that it's quite boring. Okay, there are many ways of saying that. Okay, so you can just simply say. And so listen, as we begin to look into this story, I believe this is what God is saying. And that's what I do, right? Or you can say, you know what? As I reflect upon the story, this is what I hear. The Spirit of God is saying to us. That's the other point. Okay, so there are many ways of coming to the point, but the most important thing is when you come to the point, make sure that we know that it's the point. Huh? This is common mistake by preachers. They go on and on and you don't know exactly which one is the point. <laughs> right? You say a lot of good things, you know, mean God is good all the time. All the time God is good. And you know God is good. All the time. But all the time is actually good, you know. So you just go on, you know, so we're waiting, or you know, and then you end, and let's close in prayer. <laughs> and we're wondering, which of the things that he said is exactly the main thing? Because <laughs> there's so many good things that he said. My notes are all full already, you know. But can, I, can I coach you on that? That's very good, you know what I mean? So your notes are so full, and that's that, there's no take home. You've got to identify your take home. <laughs> and make sure that the audience also distinguishes the take-home message from everything else that you said. So you got to do something like pause, okay? You can position yourself, let's say you're here, you're telling the story. You know, so Abraham or whatever, you know, Isaac, Jacob, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you say, you know, listen, so you change position. So now they know you're about to say something very important. Jesus does that all the time. He sat down and said, Verily, I tell you. Right? Those of you have ears, let them hear what I'm saying. And then he gives the take-off message. So that's how you do that in preaching. You do something to cause people to discern that you're about to tell them the main thing. And everything else fades in the background. All the stories I'm telling that I've told you, all the things that I've said, well, it just fades right now. Because now I'm going to tell you exactly what is the main thing. All right. You have questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. We only do narrative, like for example, mm-hmm. the first time you you, you, you spoke to us. Mm-hmm. You didn't ask. Usually in our church setting, we usually do the task. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when you do narrative, do you just flash it on the screen, or what do you usually do? In my, in my, uh, you know, the way I do it normally is that I go through the story with them. All right, so I, I show them the text itself, in the, but not before I preach. So it depends on. I think it, it just spoils the fun. When you, I, used, I I did that before, and it just it was not so positive. You know, I read the story first, <coughs> and then I prayed, and then I went back to the story. It, it just didn't work. So people already like you know, they heard the story. So, but when you're reading a story together with them, and you are trying to give it, you know vivid you know, explanation to capture their imagination. It's like they're engaged. It's like you're doing Bible study together. All right? Any other question? Like, yeah, uh, in narrative when we preach, mm-hmm. like normally like, we will not tell the points like one after another. Well, that, that's an option, but that spoils the fun. Okay? When, when you tell the point, What's the point? I mean, right. <laughs> you already said the point, right? So that that makes more or less like it's like uh, who killed Miss Black? Well, Mr. Black. That's it. It's finished, right? So the key to narrative style of preaching is somehow you delay that information. You don't give it. So if you can delay it, maybe do it inductively, slowly. Like I said, it's okay if you have points, all right, in the story. Like there are three ideas here about uh, faithfulness. Okay, fine. For me, I, I find that to be abnormal because there's only one thing in the story. But if you do that, I won't find penalize you. Promise. Uh, I just don't agree, but it's okay. You know, because people would do that. All right. So, would you say the point before you tell the story? I would rather that you tell the story and tell the point. That's my. <laughs> In relation to this question, yeah. what about if you are invited by a church in which 
follows a program that has scripture reading. Um, so in that case, the story would really be read before it reads. Well, w w why don't you just select only a portion? Um, Let them read a portion. Mm -hmm. Maybe just the the more the critical point, you know, just to get them interested. Anything else you want to ask? You look dazed and confused, <laughs> or sleepy, maybe. Maybe the precise word. Yes. Go on. So, in other words, given a particular narrative passage, any of the four methods that we discussed yeah. is possible. Possible. It's just that the impact or the effectiveness can be different depending on what. But, but there's no such thing as a the right wrong one. method. Yeah, there's no such thing as a wrong method. Definitely, that's very correct. I agree. So there's no, no, in fact, all the four things, all the four suggestions there, you can go on the fifth one. You can invent one. <laughs> all right. Uh, maybe there could be a new one that you can try out. Okay. There's, there are no rules there. Remember, preaching, as we know it today, is a modern invention. Okay. There's nothing in scriptures that can, they, you know, Paul never imagined maybe that we would be doing what we do today. You know, there will be a choir, you know, and then we'll stand, you know, and there's a mic. You know, he, does, he, he probably could not imagine that we would have that. <laughs> so he, he, he was not talking about that. Right? Yeah. Hey, wait, the second bell is not yet rung. <laughs> Can you bring uh, Bible example, like, uh, and several examples like Andrea? Yes. And, uh, hey guys, let's listen to Barat here. I can bring Bible example like uh, other... The yeah, there, there are no really rules. It's just wisdom here, okay? Whether I could get a verse from here or a verse from there, the key is there is wisdom. Would that really help? Would that really help my audience to understand this story? Or will it, will it complicate? Or will it cost me to spend more time than necessary? This is a wisdom talk. You understand what I'm saying? There are no rules. I can do anything I like. Okay? I can I can read Genesis to Revelation for all I care, you know? <laughs> there, there, is no, there are no rules there. But is it wise? In view of my goal in that particular case. I want them to hear a message from the Lord. Now will it be helpful for me to use a biblical illustration, a verse here, a verse there? I'll do it if it will help. I don't, I'm not bound by any rules here. I'm simply just bound with the need for me to communicate a single idea that I believe God wants to say. That's the important thing. Yeah. yeah. What if you encounter a passage where you understand the single idea that the author was saying, but then what spoke to you is the sub idea of it to preach to the people? Wow, good. <laughs> Well, it's not important really what the passage means to you. What is important is that what it actually means. Because that's more like a devotional thing, right? It's a devotional thing, and you know, like God spoke to me, which is a society issue in the text. That's uh, more like a personal thing. But delivering the message, you have to deliver what the message means, not what it means to you. All right. Thank you, guys, for... Enduring all things. <laughs> <laughs>